Um, today we're meeting to discuss synesthesia and music and we have two amazing speakers and who as usual will give their talks and then after that we'll have a Q&A session, a discussion with everyone and everyone will have a chance to ask a question or leave a comment. So um, first each of our speakers will give their talks. Um, we begin with our first speaker, who is Jenny Chai, an award-winning pianist. She has a very wide-ranging repertoire, including Beethoven, Bach, Debussy, Ravel, as well as contemporary music, of course. She collaborates with many contemporary composers, including Andy Akiho, Jaroslav Kapuscinski, and many more. Jenny Chai is also known for her work with the software program Antaskofo, which offers a real-time computer and animation response to live performance elements, enabling performers to create multimedia presentations. Her immersive approach to music is also channeled into her work with FaceArt Institute of Music, the Shanghai-based organization she founded and runs, offering music education and an international exchange of music and musicians. Jenny, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. And please begin your presentation whenever you're ready. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Marina, for a wonderful and thorough introduction. I don't know what's left for me to say. <laughs> um, I'm going to start sharing screen, hopefully as lucky as last time. Yes. Perfect. Bye -bye okay. There we go. So my name is Jenny Q. Chai, and today we are talking on the topic of synesthesia and how it connects for me, art and music. Um, just a very brief um, self introduction that um, I'm I'm based in Shanghai, and uh, um, but I traveled and worked all over the place. I'm on faculty at UC Berkeley. And uh, I, I studied and got my degrees from Shanghai Music Conservatory, Curtis Institute of Music, Cologne in Germany, and uh, Manor School of Music, where I got my doctoral degree uh, in New York. And uh, I have performed in uh, many places, many interesting places around the world, and have given lectures at Stanford and Harvard, UC Berkeley, and so. Oh, and an uh, interesting, yes, te TEDx talk, where you can find me on TED.com. And I have released, I believe, a album so far. And yes, uh, this is some reviews of me. And then especially the one in the middle you see by New Yorker that I designed uh, a program called Sonorous Brushes, where uh, I designed a program in Paris uh, where I was given this um, national French government uh, grant called uh, Cité des Arts. And uh, so I was given half a year of free studio um, across the Seine and uh, with a piano. And I was there to design a concert program influenced by uh, colors and brushes and mainly French um, paintings. So these things, you know, you can see from my works and some snapshots of um, performance, live performance uh, photos I have, that you can see that visual presentation is always very important for me. It's always been a part of my performance. Oh, and then here is my mermaid, uh, my mermaid poster. I actually did a mermaid concert also um, two years ago, I believe, in Shanghai for New Year's concert. It was a big hall and where we have visuals and all that. So that's, uh, you know, a, a side project, but uh, in China, I'm known as the mermaid pianist. And I want to tell you, and I'm sure you all know already, um, but sort of just as a recap that I think art and um, instruments or here as an example, just keyboard instruments have always been really tied together. So here you see, a, you know, clavichord, a clavichord from 13th century uh, on onwards. And it's not only a beautiful instrument, but there are always beautiful paintings or kind of, you know, engravings and almost like sculpture-like things um, 
painted onto the instrument together. It's in one. And there are so many different types of early beautiful instruments and harpsichord and clavichord, you name it, that they're all, you know, consider art pieces to collect too. On top of that, you can play on them. And also in paintings. So in paintings, vice versa, we have always had keyboard instruments, other instruments embedded in the painting world. So here you can see some paintings, you know, way long ago. Um, and then different centuries, you'll see uh, people living with instruments as part of paintings and, uh, you know, different uh, harpsichord lesson. Um, yeah, the piano room, which is a little bit more, um, that's an impressionistic time. So the perception that connects different stimuli to um, by color sensation um, is the type of synesthesia I experience with mostly. I believe that I do see colors. And when I, when I hear, but I don't know, I think mine is more triggered by sounds, uh, namely because of perhaps my upbringing. I started playing piano when I was three years old. Um, when I hear music or sounds, it connects me immediately to colors. And these color sensations, uh, sometimes also even accompanied by smell or touch, you know, I think there are other senses that are a bit connected as well, but the strongest connection is um, a visual stimuli. And the visual sensation sometimes is colorful, like pitch directly um, tied with specific colors, but sometimes it's like moving imageries, especially like chiaroscuro kind of um, dark and light, you know, shadow parts and the lightness and flashing and, you know, just things moving around. It's very lively. It's actually uh, a lot of fun to live with it. And it doesn't happen all the time. I think it, it sometimes takes different, uh, sometimes it comes to me um, unprepared. You know, it's like, it just hits me. And sometimes it happens without me even knowing that I just happened. So um, this is nothing new according to, you know, what we have learned over the years um, about artists and musicians. And so, for example, um, Vasily Kandinsky, especially a painter that I really love. And I was at his um, art exhibition the other day. And uh, I didn't know before he was such a synesthetic person. He was such a synesthesia that sounds totally have colors. And then he's just often like, painting his color, uh, his sounds out, you know. But maybe I wonder why is that a reason why especially um, connected to his paintings? I totally get it. Maybe synesthesia connect better. I don't know. But, you know, I'm sure he's such a, you know, he has such a wide uh, appeal to everyone. I'm sure his art is so powerful to people with synesthesia and without. And so I did a brief search on Google, just about composers with synesthesia. And uh, this list is definitely not complete, but you'll see some very interesting figures and some I didn't know. For example, not even a composer, I don't know, maybe Nabokov also wrote music, but uh, you know, I'm a fan, I'm a reader of Nabokov and I didn't know he's a synesthete. Um, but then it makes sense why his poetry are so vivid and to me they they create such great imageries and many others i didn't know and some i do know that are synesthetes like rimsky Korsakov, obviously scrabbing although there's a saying that scrabbing might be a pseudo pseudo synesthete and then messian for sure who is like my uh grandpa for piano because my last teacher pierre laurent Emma, was basically brought up by Messian and uh, his wife, Yvonne Lohyong. So um, yes, I used to hear Amar talk about Messian describing music with colors too. This is what interests me and it's kind of interesting. Here you can see 
there are two comparisons. I am interested in comparing specific pitch class uh, to colors that trigger in different composers or different people. And here, the top, the top photo is the photo of um, how each note, you know, there are like 12 notes, how they are um, triggering different colors specifically with different composers. And then the lower photo is a recently published nature paper. It's actually 2000, 2017 nature paper where scientists found 15 cases, uh, 15 volunteers who almost all had have absolute pitch, even though not completely, and actually more women than men and younger. I think they're, in general, the people are younger. And uh, the argument for this research paper is that musical pitch classes have rainbow hues in pitch class color synesthesia. So they're claiming, you see, out of 15 cases, how, how similar they are, how they just hear the same do as C, um, all, almost all red, and how C sharp is almost all, you know, crimson, and how these every each note is more or less so similar for the 15 cases. Although in my own experience, and my experience is talking to other synesthetic composers, at least composers and musicians, these colors are highly personal and different, as you can see as references of the top photo. So I'm even thinking about writing nature editors uh, a, uh, a comment to say their research is not accurate. But I don't know, you know, maybe people who are not musicians trained as professional musicians hear the, uh, the pitches more similarly. That could be also, but you know, more to be verified. Oh, and one more thing I could share with you, my own colors with the pitches. For example, E, that's interesting, very interesting. For most of the musicians, it seems like that the sound E is a bright yellow. That's exactly, I don't have colors. I feel strong associations of colors with each pitch class, but E is a very, very obvious color that I just see it as bright yellow as many of the composers here see. Um, and then for C, for example, C, like the note Do, for me, is white. And interesting, I found out that for Messian, uh, C is also white for him. So let's take a look at just a few well-known composers in the past and their color associations. For example, Scriabin. Scriabin was known as a synesthetic composer, even though we're not sure if he was really pseudo synesthete or not, because people also have believed that it's possible that he or Liszt, they were very much uh, influenced by Theosophy that time. And there was a whole thing about connecting colors with music there. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the most interesting and uh, great synesthetic invention Scriabin did was that he invented an instrument called clavier à lumière, a uh, keyboard with lights. And uh, it uh, appeared with each uh, key with different colors that it would project. And it is used in his work, Prometheus, Poem of Fire. And this circle of colors is how Scriabin described different notes mean which specific color to him. And for Liszt, we know he was a synesthete because during a rehearsal in 1842, he was not so thrilled by a performance of a, the Weimar Orchestra he directed. So he said, gentlemen, a little bluer, if you please. And, uh, you know, his acclaims uh, astonished the musicians. So how do people play bluer? Well, I can personally totally understand how to play bluer. 
Uh, I don't know why it was astonishing to some people. And then similarly followed, he also demanded the orchestra, Berliner Orchestra, to not play so rose because it needs to be a deep violet. Yeah, so interesting things, interesting things to think about. And um, the Hungarian composer Ligeti, well, both actually are Hungarian, interesting, right? Um, centuries later, Ligeti, whom I greatly admire and adore and love and play lots of his music, he associated musical notes and numbers strongly with colors. So five is lime green for him, for example. And he was amazed to learn in his teens, late teens, that other people did not. So he said, major chords are red or pink, minor chords are somewhere between green and brown. And coming back to Messian, Olivier Messian that I mentioned before, whom I also feel very dearly and I play some of his music. I love his sounds and colors. And he was known for also being a very, very synesthetic composer. Um, but, you know, he wrote and studied so many things and he was such a prolific composer and the teacher in his time, a great composition teacher and provided a lot of wonderful students as well and a great organist himself. Um, it was until later in his life that the Norwegian composer researcher Hakan Hospel, Ospel, sorry, Aken, Oken, Oken, Ospel, <laughs> um, studied seriously Messian's synesthesia. And so here's a link I included. Uh, you're welcome to take a look at Ospel's uh, research on Messian. It's very thoroughly done, and there are a lot of visualizations and uh, a lot of technical descriptions. It's, it's very interesting. Here are some. Um, very uh, obvious associations. So for Messian here, with different major and minors, he has different associations with colors. Um, like I said before, C is white for him, C major, but C minor becomes yellowish gray. C sharp or D flat major is gray green, even though it might not be consistent. And black gold is for C sharp minor, even though it's also not consistent. But D, D major and minor are both green, very consistent. Okay, and so on, so on. So the ones with stars are less consistent for him. Here, Messian, um, if you do not know, I will add Messian invented his own modes his own modes, that's why his sound, the sound of his music is so distinguished from other composers' music because he did not use diatonic scales like major or minor that much. He did not use existing modes or scales so much. What he did was he invented limited transposition modes. So modes with only very limited transpositions. And for each mode here, you have all the modes um, that he invented. For each mode, they have different colors. So for example, mode two. Mode two, it's blue violet. But at each um, transposition has different colors. So we'll go today quickly forward. And here are some colors and visualizations of how, for example, Messian even hears chords. Yeah, so not only on top of major, minor, diatonic scales and uh, his own modes that he hears and sees colors, also specific chords and its own uh, inversions of chords trigger different colors for him and even shapes. So for example, these four chords you can see, for him, they have to be transposed to the point that the root note is always a C sharp. I mean, here it's pronounced as C sharp or D flat, but they're all, you know, the bass note, the root is always the same note or pitch. And then depending on the arrangement of different chords, the different sounds, um, it really gives him very different very different shapes and colors. For example, the 
A, the first chord reminds him or gives him a C's rock crystal is citron. <laughs> and then also copper color with golden reflections with the interior. Um, and then the second chord gives him the image of large sapphire blue sheet circled by less intense blues and recircled by violet, you know, very specific. Third chord, he sees orange with ribbons, pale yellow, red and gold. D, the fourth chord, he sees pale green, amethyst, violet and black. So my own experience, um, it's like, if you, I don't know if you are all seeing this deed or not, but for my own experience, it's similar to what Ligeti was talking about. I didn't realize that what I saw or, or my feelings and associations were unusual until much, much, much later. I don't know even how old was I, maybe in my late 20s or so. And then I realized, oh, this is called synesthesia. And I have that and not everyone has it. For me, when I was younger, it was natural because, you know, you you live with it, you're grown, you, you just, you know, by birth, I had this. So for me, it's very natural. And I automatically assumed everyone saw and felt the same colors or feelings and then had the same ability to uh, connect different senses as I do. So it was a very natural thing and I never gave it much thoughts. Even in school, when I learned that uh, Messian or other composers had uh, associations with colors, you know, there are synesthe uh, synesthesia composers. I thought, well, but aren't we all are, you know, what's a big deal? <laughs> and maybe there are a lot of unrealized synesthetes among all of us. We just don't know. Because in music teaching, in all our lessons, I remember our teachers would say, oh yeah, a little, uh, you know, this color, that color, brighter, darker, at least brighter, darker, but sometimes, you know, um, also something like this needs to be really dry here or this needs to be wet, you know, describing the acoustics. And yeah, I think some, some people would probably uh, describe music as bluer, it needs to be bluer here or rosier there or, or golden or something like that. So colors in classical music training were always transcribed as tempre or tempre as colors. So for us, it was all the same. So I, I think it's difficult to, you know, differentiate who are really the synesthetes and who are not. And when I was teaching my students uh, and I asked them, I play a pitch and say, you know, what's the color of this? Uh, what does it remind you of the color? And they would say, oh, orange, gray, blue. You know, when you start thinking about that, it, it all comes. So uh, a few years ago, when I finally realized that I am really a synesthete, um, then I started, I, I actually included and I, I designed this whole album called Synesthete with the letters S-E-E, -E, S-C. Um, and I, it's a wordplay and uh, I designed the album with colors. So you can see there are 11 pieces. And for me, they're all very colorful pieces. They strongly trigger, they strongly trigger um, colors for me. So blue inscription, if you hear it, I think it's totally blue, so blue. And the two WC pieces, pour la quatre and pour la huit doigts, for, for the fourth and for the eight fingers, they are just flashes of lights and, you know, very active and either on a very bright white background or other colors. And it's just very fast moving lights. And then Andy Akiho is also 
a wonderful composer who got nominated for Grammys and、uh, Pulitzer Prize. He's my classmate, who's also a super super synesthetic composer.、Um, this piece, Crimson, Kara Kurunai, but in Japanese it's called it means Crimson, is from his synesthesia suite, his color suite. He so called it,、um, suites with colors,、mm, and it has other. Colors. Each piece has a different color for him, and then the other pieces by Ligeti, without me knowing, Ligeti was a synesty too back then. And Kortag, so colorful. Another Ligeti's、um, Hungarian contemporary composer, and then Messian, of course, right. So, I guess I hit this、uh, these composers right. And、uh, I want to tell you or show you a bit my personal experience. For example.、Um, This is a painting. This is actually the concrete moment that I, it helped me realize I was a synesthete. This is a painting I painted while I was learning Debussy's piece,、um, piece "Feu d'artifice." Feu d'artifice, fireworks. Yes. So I'll play a little bit of the piece that I actually ended up、uh, performing. But when I was just learning the notes. I got so triggered I couldn't practice anymore. I just went to the other room and painted what was in my head. Jenny, we can't hear the sound. We can only see the image. Oh, okay.、Mm -hmm. So, I guess I need to reshare. Uh、mm、huh. -hmm. Okay. Let me do that. Sorry about that. Share. Include computer sound.、Mm -hmm. What、well, I did choose that before, I believe. Also, let me know if you can hear it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Pause here for limited time reasons. You can find my recordings on YouTube if you like to hear more, or just、uh, you can buy my recordings. Okay, so this one is another painting that I painted、uh, after learning Messian's Kente Yujaya, which is the last piece of my album. And for me, the music—it's really just the first part of the piece, and、uh, the music goes from the left corner of the. The bottom left corner of the painting to the upper right corner of the painting. So the the colors、um, change, and it was very explosive, and、uh, you know it moves a lot. So here's my performance of the piece at、uh, UC Berkeley. And this one is Kula,、uh, Kara Kurunai, Crimson by Andy Akiho.
Yeah, very colorful sounds. And this is beige by Andy Akiho that uh, I'm very, very, I'm very, very sorry to interrupt, yeah. but we're just like, running out of time. If you just want to do a quick conclusion, like a, maybe you want to say something. Absolutely. Here. Sorry for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, not at all. So, um, basically, I'm going to stop sharing. Then um, you're welcome to look at my uh, more of my recordings and also especially beige. Sorry, I don't know why my camera was off. You're welcome to uh, look at more um, my videos, recordings on YouTube or Vimeo. Beige was a great fun piece too. And then a lot of other, other audiovisual works that uh, are interactive. Um, I just want to pose the last question which is, you know, uh, historically, I, as I was doing research on synesthesia, um, some people called it a, like someone, someone is suffering from synesthesia. You know, someone seems to think this is a illness and uh, it causes suffering. Um, and so this is surprising. And my own experience, you know, I had a lot of fun living with it and uh, has helped my creativity a lot. So um, this is something for discussion in the future, you know, well, what you think and, and how does that affect you? So thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for this beautiful overview and history of music and synesthesia in uh, synesthesia in music uh, creators. And now it's time to introduce our old friend, uh, Dr. Solange Glosser who is a senior lecturer in music at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music, University of Melbourne, with a broad uh, interdisciplinary range of teaching areas of music psychology, performance science, creativity, and expertise. And her research interests include multisensory perception and exceptional abilities, uh, with an emphasis on the impact of neurological condition. And first of all, the, the now the topics of the topic of today's are the seminar synesthesia as well as absolute pitch uh, and it, these influences on music development. Solange describes herself as a psychomusicologist with a special fascination for synesthesia. Solange obtained her Bachelor of Music with first class honors in violin performance and musicology from the Queensland Conservatorium of Music, Australia. Both a license and master's in music and musicology from the Paris Sorbonne University, France, and a diploma of orchestral conducting from the Municipal Conservatorium Paris 19. She has also obtained a graduate certificate in university teaching and a doctorate of uh, philosophy from the University of Melbourne, Australia. This year, Solange was awarded the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music Excellence in Teaching at the Conservatorium Award. Uh, Solange says emphatically that she loves discovering how we think, feel, and behave when engaging with music. Solange, congratulations on your award this year, and thank you for accepting our invitation to take part in this seminar. The floor is yours. Please share the screen, and let's just let's listen and watch and enjoy music and Solange Glasser. <laughs> Thank you, Anton, and it's so beautiful to see you again. The last time we saw each other was actually in Russia, uh, and it was one of my favourite uh, synesthesia conferences and experiences, so it's lovely to see you again here. How's mm -hmm. that? Perfect. Very uh, good. Wonderful. Excellent. Great. Thank you, everybody. So uh, welcome to this talk. Um, I'm actually going to put a timer on so I can see how, how long I'm going for. So the topic of our talk today, um, and I'd really like to begin by thanking Jenny for that beautiful overview of synesthesia and music. Um, I, I, I was just, it was wonderful to see that overview and then how, Jenny, you've been able to relate it to your own experience. Uh, and it was beautiful that you mentioned that Messiaen for you was your grandpa for the piano. Um, the research that I actually did in Paris when I was doing my master's was on um, the... Um, the uh, idiosyncratic synesthesia of Olivier Messiaen. So there's a nice little um, link that we have together there. Oh, so, wow, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd love to chat to you about it more <laughs> offline. So um, 
Today's talk, uh, what I'm going to be um, talking to you about today is an exploration that we're currently doing at the University of Melbourne, uh, exploring music related synesthetic experiences in virtual reality. Uh, and I have two of my co hosts here with me today in the audience. So we've got Ben Loveridge, who is the uh, manager of uh, immersive media. So uh, virtual reality and augmented reality for the whole of the University of Melbourne. So he's a very, very clever, technologically um, focused person. And he also happens to be one of my brilliant PhD candidates in music psychology, looking at virtual um, performance, so performance in VR. And we also have with us today Zinnia Chan, who is a composer based in Melbourne. And Zinnia is also a synesthete and a co-researcher in this project. So hopefully we'll get a chance to hear from both Ben and Zinnia today in any of the questions that you might have. Now in Australia, it's customary when we start a conversation to do what we call a welcome to country. And this is where we acknowledge the traditional elders of the lands on which we work. So the University of Melbourne, where this research has begun, is situated on the lands of the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri people, of the Kulin Nation, and they are part of the longest continuing culture in the world. It is on their ancestral homelands that the university is built, and for over 2,000 generations they have sung, they have danced, and they have performed to tell their stories. And we thank them for the privilege to do the same, and we acknowledge our elders past, present, and emerging. So uh, in this study today, you know, synesthesia, as we know, and as, as Jenny, you've pointed out to us already this morning, uh, synesthesia is a perceptual condition that is under-researched, yet it's over-represented in a population of people that is involved in creative uh, and performing arts. So immersive virtual reality will be used in our study to model and explore synesthetic experiences, uh, and provide us with research and creative arts opportunities that capture that intersectionality and the confluence of the arts. Now, this project aims to model the phenomenological aspects of music related forms of synesthesia through a data driven approach. As you can see, I've written that as D slash art slash A. So it's a data and art driven approach. And I'm going to chat a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Now, I'm not going to go too much into synesthesia because I think we've had a beautiful smorgasbord uh, and understanding of what synesthesia is. Um, but we know that there are many different forms of synesthesia and our good friend Sean Day that's here on the, on the call with us has mapped, I, I believe now, Sean, it's over 80 different forms of synesthesia. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are multiple forms that relate to music. Uh, and one, of course, that is of most interest to us are those music-related forms such as sound to color synesthesia. Now, uh, there are over, well, there were 10 types of music-induced synesthesia that I was able to map uh, in a study that I did in 2018. And you can see all of the different forms there. This was just in a small population of 17 synesthetes at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music that I had the privilege of interviewing. So you can see that even in that small uh, cohort, there was quite an extensive range of different forms of music or sound related forms of synesthesia. So, you know, Jenny mentioned chromesthesia, which is one type of synesthesia. But when we talk about music related forms of synesthesia, we're really talking about a broad, broad range of different experiences that people can have. Uh, and again, even these 10 is only, um, you know, a small part uh, of that list. So why are we using virtual reality in, in our study? Well, the first aim of this project is to model, like I said before, the phenomenological aspects of music related forms of synesthesia in a population of creative arts professionals. And we're doing this to try and increase our understanding of the impact that synesthesia has on their artistic identities and perhaps most importantly, on their artistic process. So in our case, what we're really interested in and in how having synesthesia may impact that compositional process. So again, Jenny, you talked about Mession, you talked about other synesthetes, and this is really to get into the heart of that lived experience of being a composer with synesthesia. 
Now, when we think about current research that's done into the multimodal uh, experiences of synesthetes, we know that we, we tend to rely on verbal and also two-dimensional descriptions. Um, but these methods really aren't able to capture the complexity of the synesthetic response to music. Um, and again, Jenny, I'm going to keep referring to you, but you know, you mentioned some of what you experience. And those two dimensional forms, while they're very good, they don't capture the whole of the experience. Now, based on self reports of synesthetes in research that I've undertaken uh, across multiple years, um, we know that music-induced synesthetic perceptions are often described in fluid movement uh, and in three-dimensional peripersonal space, so in the space around the synesthete. And given the affordances of immersive technology, such as virtual reality, to provide those requisite modalities to more validly, or you know, with more validity, exemplify uh, the synesthetic experience, in this project, what we also aim to do is to explore whether a virtual environment, so having that three dimensionality to the environment will enhance our ability to capture uh, and also to potentially diagnose music induced forms of synesthesia. There's another part of this, which is where we're also hoping that we can enhance those opportunities to create and engage with multi-sensory immersive artistic experiences. So using this both as a way of capturing those synesthetic experiences and then also allowing our synesthetes to have uh, the creation of these artistic outputs that uh, can then be shared with audiences. So I mentioned my D slash art slash slash A methodology before. So to frame this, this research that we're undertaking, a novel methodological approach is being trialled as an aim of this project. So this really is the second aim of this project is to trial this novel methodology. Now, a data-driven methodology is theorised to provide a framework where both data and art are resulting outputs of equal importance and validity. So often what we find in research is that either data is the main aim or outcome of that research, or it's the artistic expression that's the main aim. But what we sometimes fail to do is to have a cohesion or a, a, a symbiosis between those two. So by, by approaching research in, with this synergistic data and art direction, it's expected that the researcher and the artists who are research participants will be co-designers of both the research and the artistic outputs. So for this particular project, this methodology will uh, include a data, uh, the data that's captured through semi-structured interviews. And what we're trying to do here is to interrogate that lived world experience of our artists. And again, in this case, its composers. Uh, and we're going to be doing these interviews not in a traditional way, which is just sort of face to face across a, a table, but we're actually going to be uh, undertaking these interviews in a software program called Tilt Brush, so in virtual reality. Now for a bit of the, the boring bits, so you know the method, but you'll see that we have some quite exciting stuff planned. So we have one participant at the moment, uh, and that is Zinia Chan, our Melbourne-based composer and synesthete who is here with us today. Uh, you'll see that there's a range of information here. Zinia uh, identifies as female and non-binary. Zinia has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder level two and ADHD. Uh, and Zinia is actually unsure at the moment whether she has AP, as she describes it, she used to be able to easily identify notes on the piano when younger. And again, based on previous research that I've undertaken, as well as many uh, of our colleagues, we know that there is a, a high and strong comorbidity between synesthesia, absolute pitch and autism. Uh, Zinni has completed an online questionnaire that are based on demographics and items from the synesthesia battery that many of you here will be familiar with. And then we've conducted two interviews so far in virtual reality. This really is a work in progress. These interviews that we're undertaking are part of an iterative process where uh, almost using a grounded theory approach 
to provide us with information and data as we work through the process of using virtual reality. And we're using a MetaQuest 3 VR headset and also TiltBrush VR, which is what I described to you previously. So the first step in this process uh, was to understand the affordances and also the challenges uh, of using Tilt Brush in VR. So if you like, before we could start to understand um, whether um, VR was a suitable means for capturing the synesthetic experience, in that very first interview, what we were really keen to explore was almost like a user experience study. Was virtual reality, and in particular, was Tilt Brush a suitable means for capturing yeah the uh, synesthetic experiences that Zinnia had. So um, I'm going to play this video for you. Zinnia described the tool, the tool as being very intuitive as you'll hear, and there's an immediate recognition by her uh, of a shift away from her two-dimensional thinking that she would often use to describe her synesthesia into this three-dimensional space. Now, please let me know uh, if you have trouble hearing this. doesn't seem to be working. Is anybody able to hear anything there? No, unfortunately. Uh, but maybe you can try now. It looks like it's downloading. Uh, it should be in the slide. I've just tried to move um, a bit further on. If not, what I can do, because I've got a series of videos, so what I might do is stop sharing, mm -hmm. uh, and then I can share them from, let me try it here and see how this goes. No, if not, what I will try to do, and you'll have to excuse my panoply of slides. Um, I, have a, I have a brain that is very, um, <laughs> full at the moment. <laughs> Let me go through and I'll see if I can share it from here. Um, I think it's this one. Let's see if this works from here. And again, please let me know if you can see it. Because it's extremely... Could you hear that? Yes, uh, a sound, a voice, yeah. Beautiful, and you can see the video too? Yes. Beautiful, great, we'll use it from here then. Here we go. Extremely intuitive and it's actually quite remarkable because like I'm still painting in a 2D with a 2D mindset but I'm only now kind of getting used to the the fact that I can you know um utilize the 3D aspect of this virtual space which is very very cool Okay, so once Zinnia had been exploring that space for a short while, um, our conversation turned to a reflection on the specific textures um, that are available using this application, so Tilt Brush. Now in this short clip, Zinnia is going to explain how her thinking and reflecting is leading to the categorization of textural tools uh, that she will be able to use uh, in the future. Um. Um, there are some textures and some, um, like this ferny thing, definitely something that I think I feel a lot. And then there are some things like this um, electrical wire where I don't feel like I've ever really experienced this. Yeah. So what I feel like I'm doing at the moment is I'm actively categorizing everything um, that I'm seeing and putting them into boxes so that I can revisit them or use them when I need to use them as um, textual tools. So further on, as we continue this discussion, uh, Zinnia's expressed that for her, music is a very emotional and expressive exploration, uh, and that she likes to explore these emotions through the textures. 
So she was saying that what's really cool about using this space is that there was a lot of these different textures, again, in a way that we don't often find in a two-dimensional space, uh, such as painting. Now, Zinnia noted that these textures feel like excitement, uh, danger, soft light, magical. And she also described how some of these textures that she was experiencing and being immersed in in virtual space were triggering musical responses that were, for example, pop or hip hop or choral music. So again, for those of you who've done research in synesthesia in the past, what we're getting there is that, that, that bi-directionality, that the impact that creating in VR was having, this notion of being immersed in the colors and very importantly, in the textures in space, and that the impact of this was happen, happening both visually and also auditorily. And in fact, Sinia was describing at one point that the textual in, uh, interactions could also actually be quite conflicting and confusing uh, and could cause um, cognitive dissonance. So both visually, but also, and this is what's really interesting, of course, also auditorily. So while the aim of this first interview with Sinia in VR was, um, was simply to familiarize Zinnia to the tool uh, and to become acquainted with what was possible in VR. Um, we were already hearing that Zinnia was expressing that bi-directional impact of creating in VR. Now, our second interview uh, was focused on the artistic and visual expo exploration of one of Zinnia's compositions in VR. Um, and I'm going to share a video which gives us a first taste of this piece of zinnias. So let me see if I can find it. I think it's this one here. And once this is done, we're going to, sorry, once this is done, we're actually going to have a quick chat about what the piece actually is. But we'll listen to Zinnia first. And this actually, this piece was, this piece of video has been captured at the very end of that second video when Zinnia had finished a session in VR where she was responding in VR, so painting in VR, what she sees uh, in relation to her own composition. So before you hop out, what is your impression of what you've drawn today? What can, can you describe how you're feeling, what your impression is of what you've drawn? I feel like I'm trying to recreate the, the night sky that I was trying to create um, auditorily for people who have trouble experiencing the outback sky. I don't know if you know about the, um, I don't know if you know of the story behind this piece. I wrote it when I had a spinal injury and I was bedridden for a year or two. I really missed the country sky. So my way around it was to actually recreate it in um, music and sound form. So it's really nice now to be able to listen to it and then paint what I'm hearing um, and experience it in virtual reality, yeah. Okay, so that was Gaze Upon the Liquid Sky. Um, and uh, I'm, I note that we're sort of quickly running out of time. So I'm going to invite Zinnia to talk more about this uh, in question time if we have the chance. But the piece that you just heard there, again, called Gaze Upon the Liquid Sky was uh, created in 2022, and it's for oboe, piano and fixed media. And you'll see that Zinnia, um, who is currently a, a student at the University of Melbourne, uh, was awarded as the 2023 finalist in the Art Music Awards for Work of the Year in the Electroacoustic and Sound Art category. So it's a huge award that Zinnia was a finalist for here in Australia. And what you can see here are two visual representations in two dimensional space of her piece. So you can see here on the left, this was the the pre-composition uh, post-it note reflection that she had on the composition, so the, the uh, structure of the composition. And then here on the right is that two-dimensional aspect where you have the starry sky and this almost nebulous coloured aspect 
Uh, and to, to, to finish off again, noting the time and, and wanting us to have questions and in particular wanting any questions that you may have for Zinia. Um, this is, an, I don't know if this will work, but we'll try it from here. But this is um, an overview, now I'll have to share it, uh, of Zinia composing in virtual reality. So let me quickly go back to our videos so that you can just get again a, a, a look and a, and a listen. Uh, and for those of you with other forms of synesthesia, perhaps a taste <laughs> uh, of the compositional process, or if you like, the artistic representation process of Zinnia responding to her own music in VR. And I'd like you to think back at that image that you just saw that Zinnia herself had painted in, in two-dimensional space, and then look at what she's doing uh, in virtual reality and see if you can see any similarities. I'm so sorry to do that because it's terrible to stop music partway through. <laughs> but to sort of conclude, um, what we found so far, and this really is a watch this space, we're in the early stages of this research and we're really excited to see where this data-driven approach will take us. Um, but what we found so far is that virtual reality is an intuitive, immersive, interactive and inspired uh, tool for being able to map synesthetic experiences. Uh, and that there is a strong impact that using this type of tool may have on the compositional process. And Zinnia herself mentioned that she would not normally think about music in this three-dimensional way, which alludes to that fact that there is, again, that bi-directional or iterative process where using a more three-dimensional uh, tool to be able to map your experiences may actually support synesthetes in rethinking or redefining the way in which they engage compositionally with music. So I'll leave it there for now uh, and invite any questions that you may have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Solange, for such a rich presentation. Um, so we are now ready to begin the discussion. If you have a question, please raise your virtual hand or write down your question in the chat. Maybe if you have a comment, do that as well. And we traditionally begin the discussion by giving an opportunity to our speakers to comment on each other's talks. So maybe ask a question if you have any. So Jenny and Solange, please. And Solange, can you stop? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I was trying to find it. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, hello, Solange. I thought it was wonderful. You know, it's so great to hear and see what uh, um, synesthetic uh, researchers have um, taken to different areas and how much uh, it's been taken very seriously uh, among professional musicians. And uh, well, I would love to personally volunteer <laughs> to your project. <laughs> It'd be. It would be an absolute honor and brilliant to have you. You know, I'd be very, very keen to, to consider, you know, and understand what, what you think about using VR. Have you used VR before, Jenny? Yes, I have. Uh, in fact, I was uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Yaroslav Kapuscinski, we didn't get a chance to hear uh, me playing his music, but it's always audio visual and he's a former chair at Stanford. Um, and uh, he always wrote a lot of audio visual music for me and he's, his music's what I tour around the most. And um, um, there are some pieces of his we were trying to develop into a VR forum. So I have a bit of experience uh, experiences uh, wearing the VR glasses. 
Beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. No, no further questions from me, but I would love to say that if you ever wanted to champion a young researcher's work, Jenny, um, Zinnia is a brilliant composer and I'm sure that she would love to compose some synesthetic music for you. It'd be very interesting. Oh, I would love to... that. Yes. Um, I have not been to uh, Australia yet, and it's definitely on my to-do list, and I'd love to do that. And, uh, you know, just imagine, because I have played a lot of composers and synesthetic composers' music, so I, I wonder how it is also if I have the opportunity to paint out. I also compose myself uh, a little bit, and but if I have the opportunity to draw out, you know, different composers' music to yeah. what it mean to me. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Great. So uh, now anyone else in the public, if you have a question, please feel free to ask your question. And in the meantime, uh, while you're thinking, I have a question um, to both of you, but especially to Jenny. So during the seminar, some other speakers of ours who have synesthesia mentioned that it kind of changes with time, synesthesia. And I'm just wondering, um, sometimes they mention that they can do something to change it as if they can develop it in a certain way for specifically for it to help um, in their creativity, in their art making. So when you mentioned as well that Synesthesia helps you, does it, do you, do you develop it? Do you change it? How does it change in a way that it helps um, more and more in your creative work? Anything? Oh, thank you, Marina, for the question. I think naturally uh, I try not to influence it too much myself because I'm rather f fascinated by how it comes to me myself. And there's one, uh, there are many actually, oh, here's my cat. Um, <laughs> there are many experiences that I only realized afterwards that it was uh, synesthetic because, for example, uh, my Jewish uh, mom took me to this car wash and uh, I thought uh, it was so awesome. And then I told my other friend who visited us, oh, then, then, you know, you should take him to the car wash also because it was like so much lights and everything and rock music they were playing. And then she was like, ah, oh, there were lights for sure, but there was no music. So <laughs> I didn't even realize, I thought it was all, you know, very, very uh, prominent sound and everything. And then there were times, um, when I met this living Buddha in Shangri-La, he gave me these like blessing beats. And when he opened the, 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 the pocket and I thought I saw beautifully shiny, like vibrant pink pearl, mother pearl color beads. And then I was very happy and I took them back to Shanghai and I opened them and they were just like dark, uh, black almost. <laughs> and, it's like unconfirmed experiences and I don't know, did they change color or did I see something, you know, that took me away from reality. And now I started meditation and I realized when I meditate, all these shapes and colors and lights and flashes actually are very similar sometimes in, um, in the experience that I experience when, when there's music, even though in meditation, there's no music. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you're not doing anything specifically to develop it? Um, no, I I would rather hope to preserve preserve it as most original and natural. And uh, I'm just like a third person observer kind of watching it and enjoying it. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Anyone else has a question? Please go on. Anton, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, just a brief question to Jenny and Xenia both. Um, let me formulate this quite clear, clearly. Um, when you visualize your music, either in VR or through other means, uh, apart from visualizing, which is a value in itself and of itself, um, this particular expressive means i mean visualization influence your compositional skills as well does it add anything to how you understand music as music not something else uh, i mean taste or color or whatever through uh visualization oh, oh Zinia, go ahead 
Thank you for the question, Anton. Um, so Solange Glass, Dr. Solange Glasser uh, was actually the person who helped me realize I was a synesthete. Um, so that was only a few years ago. But before then, I did have an experience where I was doing a composition uh, national composer workshop camp. Um, and I didn't realize that composers or musicians don't usually describe um, works using adjectives like more Christmassy or, you know, the spirals within crystals. Um, and I remember this for this particular piece. Um, I, so I was still a, a young emerging composer. For this particular piece, there was a change of conductors and we had sat down. He had written Christmassy. I'd, he had, I explained the piece to him. Um, and when we changed conductors, the conductor was like, what's Christmassy? <laughs> um, and that's when I started to realize how much I latch onto visuals um, and not just the visuals of Christmas, the snows, but also the emotion that it evokes. And then I use those emotions to try and recreate what I feel Christmas is like for me within that particular piece, even though the piece had nothing to do with Christmas. I I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but um, for me, that's a good example of how maybe the visuals do uh, affect and in uh, my practice, my compositional practice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it does answer. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jenny. And 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 your side. Um. Well, I think because I don't compose as much, uh, my uh, profession is more that I realize I uh, interpret composers music so I, I think it just helped me so much in terms of understanding musical context texture colors what it evokes and it gives me very vivid um, imageries uh, and goals of what I want to work on so um, you know I hope that you know it might makes my playing more colorful Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, please, John. Oh, unmute myself here. <laughs> uh, I forget who it was, but somebody previously raised the whole issue of the idea of suffering from synesthesia. And so I thought I'd bring that on back for discussion. That's right, Sean, hello. It was actually uh, my open-ended question um, about suffering from synesthesia. Uh, so I'm, I know that others have heard this analogy before from me, but I'll bring it up again. I'm sick. Have a tendency to repeat myself, but I'd say I I say I often compare synesthesia with let's say like okay if you have if you have a sense of smell if you're able to smell things then there are certain odors that you love to smell like fresh baked cookies or uh what your like your lovers perfume or cologne or something like that, or uh, your, say, your favorite home cooked meal. So, right? And you say, and, but on the other hand, if you have a sense of smell, you've also smelled things like vomit and say, and dog manure and extraordinarily filthy public restrooms. <laughs> so, right? Okay, so, right, right. Okay, so if you have a sense of smell, do you suffer from having a sense of smell, or is it right? Uh, see, see. Now, I mean, there are, see, with synesthesia, there's, you know, say, it's like a sense of smell. There, you know, say, there are wonderful things that you intentionally pursue. There are terrible things that you deliberately avoid. It's like most things, it's like if you have congenital synesthesia, you're growing up with it. By the time that you're you're my age, most of the things are every day and you don't even notice them anymore. Right? Right. So it's like, uh, right, there, 
there are people who do have difficulties with certain aspects of their synesthesia. Most synesthetes don't. And so this a, so there are there are some people who encounter certain things that they suffer from from their synesthesia. But to say that to say that state that in general that people suffer from synesthesia, it's like saying that people suffer from being able to smell. Well, thank you, Sean, so much for answering the no, question. It's, 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 right. So, right. See, uh, see, I, I, I'll add that see, I think part of the reason why people say suffer from synesthesia is that synesthesia used to be looked at looked upon as being, um, say, some type of problem. That because it would because it was different. Once we realize that, 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 that something that's something that's rare, say something that's ra rare is not abnormal. There's a difference between something being rare and abnormal. Right? Once we realize that synesthesia is just rare but not abnormal, we realize that it's not that it's not a medical problem. It's not a medical condition. It's a trait, like having red hair or green eyes. You think of it as a trait and people people don't suffer from having red hair. Right? People suffer from what other people think about red hair. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Um, I can see that we have a question from Christoph. Do you want to ask your question, please? Oh, yeah, I have one question to the uh, Solars. to the, I wonder how it, I mean, maybe it's too technical and happy to sh cut me short, but I wonder how they quantify all these like 3D drawings and music. It, it might be quite difficult if you, if I understand it correctly, they wanted to do some data analysis on that. So I was wondering like what the approaches are to capture the nature of all these shapes and so on, which can be quite difficult, I imagine. Yeah, Christoph, thank you so much for your question. Uh, we have Ben Loveridge with us here, who is our uh, VR uh, expert. So I'm going to have, hi, Ben, nice to see you on the screen. Um, ben and I are also actually in parallel to this project. We're also working on another project with a immersive, um, what would you call them, Ben? Are they a, what would be their technical developer. term? Developer. <laughs> uh, and what we're working on at the moment, so I mentioned very briefly that one of the aims of this research uh, is to create a, um, a diagnostic tool. To be able to do that, one of the ways in which we're thinking of applying this is to look at the consistency uh, of responses from synesthetes across time. So we know that consistency is often the gold standard of synesthesia, and we can debate in another forum whether consistency should be the gold standard and is the gold standard. But if we leave that argument aside for a moment, uh, one of the things that we're hoping to do is to be able to capture different forms of data in VR. Is it complicated? Yes. Is it impossible? No. And so with this developer, and you can tell that I'm not the technologically minded one of the group, um, what, we're, what we're trying to achieve in Tilt Brush is to capture whatever data we can and then to see what's usable. And it's actually extraordinary how much data can be captured. So not only can you capture color, easy, right? So RGB, color, you could see on the wheel in some of those videos that you've got your typical color picker. So that's the kind of easy stuff that we can do in two dimensional space. But you can also capture the size, you can capture brush strokes, um, brush speed. So the speed at which someone is, is using the brush, the length, the, the quantity, the thickness, the type of strokes. So there is a lot that can be captured. Uh, and then the next step in that is to see again, what we can do with that data, how we can quantify it for each individual person, and then to see 
if there is consistency across time. One of the other things that we're experimenting with at the moment is using large language models such as ChatGPT to allow people to, to not actually use the brushes, but to describe in words what they experience and to have a plug-in in Tilt Brush where we can capture those words and those words will then turn into visual representations in three-dimensional space. We're not there yet, um, but that's sort of an end goal as well. And in the future, what we would love to be able to do with this is to almost gamify it where uh, anyone with a, with a VR headset would be able to use this type of application for artistic and creative purposes. But what we could do is then capture the information across large populations of people to see where people fall almost, you know, again, I'm going to go back to a, um, a debate in the synesthesia research, but to go back to that debate around um, uh, sort of the, the spectrum and whether as a population we fall along a synesthetic spectrum as opposed to being you either do have it or you don't and what that might tell us about both individual experience but also experience across populations. And if I missed anything, Ben, please jump in and tell me that everything I said there was complete bogus. No, spot on. Oh, good. <laughs> Can I throw in something? Um, to Jenny and Xenia, probably, because you, you are ambassador of different cultures, obviously. And uh, there is a huge debate that synesthesia might be universal or the other way around culture sensitive um, how do you feel how does it expose into your own background uh, of being a uh, representative of different cultures both and at once uh, and does synesthesia and synesthetic mechanism do feel different when you expose this into your you know versatile backgrounds Zinia, okay. Um, that's a very good question, Anton. I was exposed to a lot of uh, Zen painting methods when I was younger. Um, and I think when I work with the t 2D painting medium, that's the method that I use to blend colors. So I go with a very intuitive uh, approach. And that's actually what my research masters is based on, turning extra musical art form into composition. And uh, for me, within my composition as well, I use a lot of ad libs, a lot of uh, improvisational boxes. I allow a lot of freedom for performers to actually um, tap into their own senses as well. I'm not exactly sure if that's because of my cultural influence, but I do know there's a lot of um, kind of flourishy motifs and rhythms um, that I grew up with in, in the music that I listened to as well as, you know, it was uh, we had ABC classics on one side of the house and then we had Chinese opera and other types of music on the other side of the house with my grandparents. Um, so uh, the other thing is I have really strong connections to taste in food and emotions. Um, so for a long time I was connecting food to composing. So that definitely would have had an influence. Um, I haven't introspective on it, uh, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure how I can answer that question in this moment, but maybe it's something I will explore in the future. Um, I will jump in. Um, yes, thank you for uh, answering, Xenia. I totally relate to your experience. And uh, thank you for asking this question, Anton. I, I think it's rather a deep and serious answer. I mean, question that, you know, it would take me some serious uh, reflection to be able to answer it uh, comprehensively. But, um, you know, talking like Xenia reminded me about connecting other senses. I, I believe that, you know, synesthetes probably have the ability to connect to other senses as well. Maybe some just not as emphasized. And for me, also being a pianist, I often, describe touch and materials to my students. And that for me is very important. Like how you, because I use my hands all the time and how how you feel and stroke or, 
or hit or touch the keyboard um, makes really different sounds. So for me, they're directly connected. And uh, of course, uh, as my Chinese background, I love food and all kinds of tastes. Chinese food have a lot of a huge variety of food and temperature and smell. And sometimes, you know, so I think I'm just rather sensitive in that sense. But to talk about especially an Eastern philosophy influence for me is the emptiness, the nothingness or the emptiness or in Chinese they call liu bai, which is uh, to state the, 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 the whiteness that they leave, the space in between things, colors, objects. And that I also personally, I philosophically, uh, for my own life philosophy, um, I'm more of a Taoist or something like that. So that, that part, I think it's, um, you know, addition. It opens more spatial stuff, and perhaps that's why I also respond more to French composers' uh, music and colors. Um, maybe perhaps, you know, French composers more influenced by Eastern philosophy, and also John Cage, that, you know, I have many of my teachers were John Cage's uh, pianist or uh, students, so for, um, Morten Feldman, John Cage, you know, composers with more Eastern philosophy influence also, um, I think I do connect uh, in a in a deep way. Okay, thank you, thank you both for these answers. Very insightful, and well, lots of open questions and answers that remain. But unfortunately, we need to wrap it up now. The seminar is practically over, and we'll need to <laughs> say goodbye. Thank you, Jenny, Zinia, and Solange for uh, your extraordinary ideas and uh, sharing your personal experience. So in next time, we'll have a real feast for the eyes because in our seminar that will take place on November 29th, we will explore synesthesia and its contribution to visual art. So that's quite a crossing here. And our guest speakers will be Professor Michael Bannessy, uh, head of School of Psychological Science University of Bristol, uh, Daniel Mullen, a Scottish painter based in Amsterdam, and Lucy uh, Engelman, an artist, filmmaker, and a cynicist. Together with Dasha Paris, a visual artist and photographer based in Helsinki, Finland. So make this date special in your calendar and get ready to ask your questions at our next get together in a week. So in the world of synesthesia, words become Flavors, colors turn into melodies, and ideas become experiences. So we very much appreciate your inquisitiveness and enthusiasm in our today's seminar. And thank you very much to join us next time. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Anton. Thank you. Thank you.